Live from Lake Fort Marina. Well, if you're watching on YouTube, it's not really live, but <laughs> <laughs> we don't edit it none, so it's kind of live. Yeah, it's it like, it, live. it's right. delayed live. It's just extremely delayed, right? Extremely. All right, back for our Friday night seminar. If we do these every two weeks at Lake Fort Marina, we, this is our first one in several weeks, so we took a little break. We had some bad weather, just fell on Fridays when we were going to do these, and uh, talking with the owners of the marina here. There was nobody here because the weather was so bad, so we just decided to hold off on those for a little while. But now we're back, and we're back right on time, man. It's pre dagum spawn. Like, it is full go pre-spawn fishing at Lake Fork. Big fish are getting caught every single day out here. Um, it's not easy. It's easy to go zero out there right now. It's also easy to go catch about 35 pounds on your best five right now. Like, it's like... 25 to 30 pound bags, if you get five bites, are pretty much the deal. Like the last video that we just put out the night, last night, I wet the bed on three or four fish and didn't put them in the boat, but we, got, we only got five fish in the boat and we had 27, 28 pounds. We only caught five. So that's just, that's how the lake's fishing right now. It's not a whole bunch of bites most days, not a whole lot of bites, but some of that's gonna change very very quickly so we're going to talk to you tonight about what's happening right now how we've been catching them how we're going to probably continue to catch them but with these weather changes as we get in further into february like we've had yesterday and today it's going to change that bite it's going to change the numbers of bites it's going to change the techniques it's going to change the location it did today and yesterday as well so uh we're going to get into all that tonight we're going to have a lot to talk about as far as the current activity at lake fork we always do in the pre-spawn because it's it's a changing time of year right and not only is it a changing time of year, but it's a changing time of year when the fish are warming up so their metabolism's picking up and all the biggest fish in the lake are all third trimester pregnant. You know what I'm saying? Like, who's had a pregnant wife? Like, that girl eats, dog. Like, <laughs> she puts away some groceries. So this is the time when those big females feed the most of the whole year, really. They're, they're warming up, metabolism's picking up, they're pregnant, all good stuff. So we'll cover all that. Um, the videos that you guys have seen lately, we, it's just been a jig. I mean, if you were to go down and look at the deck of my boat this morning, you would have seen three rods and they all got a black and blue jig tied on them, right? Like, that's the deal. But when you get these warm days, and we haven't had what I like to call a real warm trend yet. I mean, there has been a warm trend, a little bit of one. But what I look at when I'm looking for warm trends, guys, is nighttime temperatures. Now, if you look forward to next week, you will see two nights in a row where the, the lows overnight are in the mid 50s. The average water temp on the lake, and it varies today because we have had some warming. So you've got the very shallow extreme backs of pockets are significantly warmer than the main lake. But the main lake in the middle of the creek arms is still hovering around the 50 degree mark, 52 ish, 50 somewhere in there for the most part in, out in the middle of the lake or the middle of the big creek arms. Um, so when you have an overnight low of 55, what that does is typically most days you'll have a warming cycle and a cooling cycle at night, right? It'll be warmer during the day than the water temp, so it'll warm up a little bit. It'll get colder than the water temp at night, and it'll cool down a little bit. So the water temp just kind of does this, and it may climb a little, but it still does this. Even though we've had 70 degree days the last couple days, at nighttime it's gotten well below the water temp. So even though it climbs, like today it climbed, tonight it's going to fall. Last night it fell before it climbed again today. And that's why you don't see a huge jump in water temperature across the entire lake. When it goes up during the day and then at night it doesn't get colder than the water temp, it never goes back down. So it goes up, maintains, and then goes up again, and then maintains again, and then goes up again. Now you can start to see how that water temperature across the entire lake elevates immediately within a couple days. I mean, three day warming trend is like the bee's knees, man. That's like the best days of the year for me that I know, like I can go, like I can call my shot. Like when we pull up to the boat ramp, like y'all better tie your knots real good today, boys. Like those days are the third day of a warming trend in the pre-spawn every year. Those are the days when we can go catch them kind of almost any way we want to shallow. I mean, it's, it's just that good. So I guess that being said, let's talk about what we've been doing because we're also in the same situation at the same time that we're dealing with that right now little bit of a warm-up well tomorrow the high is like 
Alaska or something. I don't know what it is cold. <laughs> What's the warm temperature for tomorrow? 48. Yeah, 48. So so the high tomorrow is going to be under the water temperature, right? So now it's never going to warm tomorrow. It'll Yeah, it'll cool tonight, never warm tomorrow, maybe a little bit with, if some sunshine pops out, but not much, and then cool again Saturday night. So by the time that we get to Sunday, those fish are going to be right back where they were at the beginning of the week when it's cold. And the water's 49 or 50 or 48, whatever. I've seen it as cold as 47, 46 at times over the last couple mm -hmm. weeks, but it's hovering around that 50 mark. So what's going to happen, they'll probably transition back to that tomorrow, but by Sunday, this will be the bite. The bite that you guys have seen on the last couple videos. The black and blue jig bite is going to be the deal. So let's break into that first, and then we'll talk about what we can do at the end of next week for our next warming trim. Uh, I guess we'll just start with the jig itself. But a, bla a black and blue jig is the deal, man. On Lake Fork, it has been forever. I'm sure everybody knows we talk about it a lot. Well versed in the history of this little dude right here and all of his cousins. Uh, this one bait right here is hands down responsible for more share lunkers than anything else in the history of bass fishing. I mean, maybe that changes eventually now that live scope's in play with all these swim baits and stuff catching these big fish now. Um, but as of today, by far the most share lunkers caught is a black and blue jig. Uh, part of that is because when we get into wintertime, we catch such bigger fish. Does anybody know why all your, your average fish size is so much bigger in the wintertime? Because during cold water, you know, fish are, are cold-blooded creatures. So the colder the water temps are, their metabolism slows down, they eat less, right? So a male bass... Metabolism slows down. He's got no reason to eat. He can not eat for a whole day, for multiple days. He, he can just not eat for a while. Even though a female bass's metabolism slows down, she's just eating eggs. She is pregnant. So the female bass has a bigger need to eat in the wintertime than the male bass does. That's why a higher percentage of your fish, so much higher, almost most of your fish in the wintertime, a lot of times are female bass and they're bigger. We all know female bass are bigger than males. So the reason you catch such a bigger average size of fish in the wintertime is because most of what you're catching are big females. And the males just aren't biting because they don't have to when it's cold. So that's one of the reasons that I think this bait has caught so many big giant share lunker. For the, anybody that doesn't know that's watching, that's over 13 pound bass that have been turned into our Texas Parks and Wildlife program over the years since the 80s. Um, but this bait shines in the wintertime. We all know a jig is a good bait in the winter time. You got a question, sir? Is there anything to do with weight? Yes, we're going to get into the weight. Yes, absolutely. We're definitely going to cover the weight. But a jig shines in the winter time, and why a jig shines in the winter time? If you'll notice, you see how the skirt sticks out, sticks out off the bait. Can everybody see that? How the skirt's bouncing? Look when I when I just hold it. See how the skirt bounces, right? So the reason this bait is so effective in the winter time, one of the main reasons I believe, is that this big this bait has a unique trait and there's a few fishing baits that do this this one probably does it better than any and to more of an extreme version of any it creates movement without movement what i mean by that is that bait can go sit dead still on the bottom and in the water that skirt is just going doing this and in a bass's world something that dives to the bottom and goes he's flexing on it's like it's like it's like a dude in junior high doing that to you i mean what are you gonna do? Like if you're a big, like if you're the big alpha dominant kid at the school, some dude does that, some little punk does that to you, you're probably gonna shove him. You're gonna reach out and just push him off you, right? That's basically what that bass is doing when it hits that jig. That jig goes down there and goes, whoo, flexes up on him, he goes pow. And that's why even though it's cold and these fish are lethargic, if you'll watch those videos real close and watch our rod tips, they are knocking the fire out of this. Vic was with me. They are knocking slack in your line, dude. It's, Sometimes you don't you don't hook them because they knock so much slack in your line. You're like trying to catch up to them, and by the time you do, you set the hook, and they're not there anymore. But they are just knocking the crap out of that jig because it goes down there, hits the bottom, and flexes that skirt out, and they just pound on it. <coughs> Smart man, he's into jig fishing. Y'all hearing? <laughs> Smart man. So that's kind of you know that's some of the reasons why the jig is so effective. It just it shines in cold water because it sits there and sits dead still and still moves. It also creates that defensive. It also creates that defensive posture that gets an aggressive reaction from a bass. Uh, to the jig that's been working best for me, weight 
is probably the, well, head design is number one. That's the most important thing. You got to have the right head design on the jig. And, and we'll go over that in detail on the end of jig video. But I'll just give you guys my recommendation for now. This is a six inch hybrid jig. I've fished a lot of jigs over the years. I love the Santone jig. Um, I love the Impact jig. There's a lot of jigs that I've been really big fans of that I've fished a lot until this one came out. This is the best head design I've ever used because it combines the attributes of being weedless. It's very weedless coming in and out of cover, but yet it still hooks the fish in the top part of the mouth. And we'll explain that in depth in our next video on jig fishing. But that's my recommendation. It's a hybrid jig from 6 inch fishing. But the weight, outside of the head shape, the weight is the most important decision you make on a jig because the weight determines the rate of fall. Now, most people, the common knowledge in wintertime is, well, you need to go smaller profile. You need to slow the bait down, slower rate of fall. The fish are moving slower, the bait are moving slower. Get me a slow rate of fall on, on my bait, right? That's what everybody kind of thinks. I couldn't disagree with that more. You know, y'all said that my kid sounds just like us, uh, what's the <laughs> Does he throw a drop shot too? Probably. Oh my God. <laughs> Buy him some baby gay dudes right now. <laughs> so the way determines the rate of fall and, and I could not disagree with the, the common knowledge more. The harder the bite is, the more post frontal it is, the heavier jig that I go to, believe it or not. The more cold trending, the more those fish should not be biting, I actually go to a heavier and heavier, even up to a one ounce jig at times. Because what that creates is a reaction scenario. If you fished a lipless crankbait or a chatterbait in grass, then you'll know that when you get that touch just right and that chatterbait or that trap hits that grass and pauses and you rip it out, that's when you get your best bites. Same thing with what we're doing with this jig. We're putting this in root systems at the base of these trees on these creek channel drop-offs and that jig is climbing through those roots and it'll get hung like this, right? And you just kind of lift your rod and it pops free. Has everybody felt that before? So that when that bait pops free, it goes, and the heavier that jig is, the faster it goes. It's no different than when it pauses on that grass on that trap and you rip it, it pops out, same bite. And that's when they hit it. As Soon as it turns down and starts falling real fast, it's a reaction. That fish is sitting underneath those root systems all balled up in those root systems like, just mad, cold, I don't want to talk to nobody, don't touch me, nobody get near me, right? Big dominant fish. And this jig pops over that root and flies down into their face, they snap at it. And that's another reason the bites are so violent because it is a total reaction bite to these fish when that jig comes flying by them in those root systems. So the more reluctant the fish should be to bite, I go to a heavier and heavier jig to get more of a reaction. Okay, so three quarter ounce has been my mainstay here lately. We're also throwing half ounce. I never throw less than a half ounce in the winter time, never. Which a half ounce jig will create a pretty good rate of fall, pretty quick. You know, on the good days when it's warm and sunny, the half ounce seems to work better. They, tend, they do tend to bite a little bit slower falling jig a little better on the good days when it's like kind of warming up a little bit, it feels good outside, you know. But on those nasty days, it's that three quarter ounce jig every time. That's the one they bite better. And you catch bigger fish on it because it's more of a reaction bite, right? So. Okay, so that covers that. Now, I do agree though in the winter time with making your bait compact. In the summertime, I'll throw a full skirted jig with a full, a full size crawl, creature bait on it, whatever, as a trailer. In the wintertime, I do trim my skirt right to the bottom. I mean, you can see that skirt doesn't hardly hang, it doesn't really hang below the, sh the bend of the hook right here. And I also take my trailer and cut the top of it off. And I want, the key thing is I want my hook point coming out where my appendages start. Or the bend of the hook. See where the, bend, the hook exits the body, right where the appendages start? And what that does is that makes everything compact and it makes the appendages start on the creature bait right where the skirt stops. And it makes it all look nice and smooth and it's a nice, even though that's a three quarter ounce jig, if I just handed you this jig, you, would, you wouldn't necessarily think it was till you really looked at the head because it looks like a smaller profile jig. It doesn't look like a big giant three quarter ounce jig. Uh, I do think that's a key component as well. So that's the jig. Now rod, this might be the one technique it's, it's definitely one of the techniques. I know drop shot is another one, shaky head is another one. All these techniques where we're dragging a bait, but especially in the winter time, uh, sensitivity on your rod is so important. Uh, you know, I, I don't know that there is such a thing as too stiff of a rod to fish a jig on, but you gotta have the sensitivity. Okay, and so 
for a jig rod, you want to maybe spend a little more money on that, right? Because the more money you spend, typically the better quality blank you're going to get, and typically the more sensitive it's going to be in a heavier action rod. Uh, I, I brought mine right here. It's a 7.7 seven Heavy Sensory Series from Six Sense Fishing. This rod right here, and I'll try to bend it for you guys that y'all can see. I mean, there's not, I mean, I'm pushing on that hard. Not much give in that at all. Now, the, the reason that's so important is, like I said, we're fishing root systems at the base of these trees. When I set the hook on an eight pounder in a root system, he better come up right now. Like if I've got a medium heavy rod and I set that hook and it bows that rod up and that fish doesn't immediately start lifting his head, there's a good chance that that fish has time to react and swim anyway, he's gonna get tangled up in that root system and I'm never gonna see him. But if I can get his head, the initial move on the hook set, his head comes up, I can usually get him out. And so that's why it's important to have a big, heavy action rod. But to have a heavy action rod that's sensitive enough to fish a jig on, it's kind of hard to find. It's not the easiest thing to find. You go get you a 7.6, seven, 7.7 seven, seven extra heavy and it's a $100 rod, you're going to miss some jig bites. Like you're not going to feel all the bites because while they do snap at it and hit it hard, that's not always the case on a jig. We know that, right? There's times when they just kind of, oh. <laughs> let me let me let me talk to you for a minute come in they just kind of mushy bite it right so you're going to miss some fish if you don't have the right sensitivity in your rod and if you guys want to a couple of y'all i mean it's kind of hard please don't beat my rod this listen <laughs> listen this is my baby like i'm not sure i wouldn't trade one of my kids for this rod right here I don't think I would, but I don't know for sure. You know, have to think about it. yeah, <laughs> I would have to. There'd be a pause, right, for sure. So, this is a first generation Century Series rod. This was one of the first ones that came out, and uh, this it's even missing one of the guides off of it. But it, this is my baby, so please be careful with this. But pass that around, and I want you guys to feel. Even though I just told you about, I showed you how much it bends. None. Feel how light that rod is, and that's where the sensitivity comes from. I'll tell you this, when you're looking at jig rods, and I'm not telling you to buy that particular one. I love that one. That's my baby. But look for a rod made of graphene, not graphite. Most rods are made of graphite, have been for a long time. About four or five years ago, a few companies started messing with this new material called graphene. It's stronger than graphite, but all the properties are basically the same. So they can use less material and still get the same power out of the rod, the same strength out of the rod. Therefore, it becomes, even though it has the same strength and durability, it's much lighter. Um, and it's just a graphene rod for these sensitive techniques is huge to have because you can get so much more power uh, and still have the sensitivity qualities that you want. Uh, use 20-pound fluorocarbon line. Is there anything I'm missing on, on gear? I mean, I use a high-speed reel and 20-pound fluorocarbon line. <coughs> That's pretty generic stuff, but uh, I don't like to use braid ever. Well, braid, it's almost like it cuts a groove into the tree or something. Like these trees that have been under the water for 40 years get soft, right, down under that, under that water. And like when you're dragging that jig across it, it's almost like it digs that jig into the wood. You'll get hung up a lot more with braid than you will with fluorocarbon. Uh, and when, then when you do get hung up, there's no stretch to kind of pop it out of there with braid. It's harder to get it unhung with braid. So I really don't like fishing braid on wood on these jigs I, I really prefer i think i think fishing 20 pound fluorocarbon is an absolute must in my opinion is there any questions on that on that on that gear before we move on i have a question why do you go with the twin tail as opposed to like a chunk style trailer is good question action without that action good question yeah yeah so the thinner the appendages the easier it'll move while it sits still especially in cold water cold water plastic starts stiffening up so Chunk trailers are fine, and they have kind of, that, that kind of, if I was going with the theory of let's slow it down, then I would go with a chunk trailer because it's going to move less. Like if I'm trying to do that, then that's what I would do, but I'm not doing that. I'm going the opposite. I'm wanting that bait to make ruckus and swim, and I'm, I'm creating a reaction bite instead of, instead of dragging a jig on the bottom on a rock and, and getting that begging bite, I'm getting that reaction bite. So therefore, a swimming trailer, I mean, I've used, before those came out, I used to use uh, rage crawls and rage chunks because it kicks, you know. Um, I've used Berkeley's chigger crawl back in the day, but it doesn't swim. When rage crawl came out, I went to that. And then when this bait came out, I went to that because it does the same thing, but it does it better in colder water because the appendages are thinner. It swims. Uh, a speed crawl is a good one that'll swim for you. Um, but that stroker crawl, 
to me, the best jig trailer all around, year round, for years, was the Yamamoto Twin Tail Grub. But man, it was just, it was smaller than I wanted it to be on a bigger jig. Like the profile of, of the Twin Tail Grub was just smaller than I wanted it to be. And if you look at that stroker crawl, essentially what it is, it's bigger arm, so it's a bigger armed Yamamoto Twin Tail Grub with a creature bait body, with a beaver style body. That's essentially what a stroker crawl is. And the day that I saw it, the first day I saw it, I went, that's the best jig trailer I ever made. And now it's the only trailer I throw on a jig year round. I throw the full size one during the summertime on my, on my heavy jigs out deep, you know, that we're dragging on the bottom, football jig style. And I, and I cut it down during the winter and make a small profile. But it's the only trailer I use on any jig. Phenomenal, phenomenal jig trailer. When you're pit, pitching to these stumps, do you pitch it up beside it or do you hit the stump? And Great question. Mm. Great question. So let's so uh, let's move into that because that's that's the next most important part about this jig fishing deal. And I said I'm going to do an in-depth video on a jig next week. I guess we're just going to do it right now. Uh, <laughs> so two key components to how to fish these creek channel stumps. One is to have the jig moving in the right direction to where it can fall into the channel. You don't want to be dragging up the embankment of the channel. You want... <laughs> Charlie? Ch Charlie. Charlie? You know better than that, Charlie. That's them fighting words right there. Um, no, you don't want to be dragging up the embankment of the creek channel. You want it to fall. It need, to get this bite where it snags root and goes... <clears throat> To get that reaction bite, you have to be falling down into the creek channel. So, I may if I'm positioned, if my boat's in the creek channel, which it is at times, I'm not making very long casts because I've got to at least be making a 45 degree angle. If this is the outside edge of the creek channel, my boat's in the channel, I've at least got a 45 it to bring the jig down into the creek channel. I can't throw up here and just bring it along the edge. It's got to go behind that stump and fall in. The next key aspect is to throw past the stump. And the deeper the water is, the further past that I need to throw. Um, you want to sneak up on these fish and spook them in the biting reaction bite, right? So I'm throwing past that tree. I should drag it through flat nothing for at least a few feet, you know, a couple feet before I start feeling the backside of that root system. And then once I start feeling that roots now, I really slow down and, and I'll kind of throw it past that deal and I'll kind of drag it with my rod tip down and just get it up there. And I'm not really worried about going slow at that point. I'm just worried about keeping bottom contact. I am that. Got to keep bottom contact. But I go ahead and drag it at a decent little rate of speed on the bottom until I fit the first root. Then I stop, lift my rod tip up, and now I start creeping. I'm just creeping. And I'm not shaking the jig. I see guys get in my boat sometimes, and they kind of hop the jig around. I'm like, no, 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 no. Don't do that. The root's going to put that action on there for you. You don't need to do nothing. You want it to stay on the bottom. You don't want it hopping because you might go and have a little slow kind of soft hop over that root. You want it to grab that root, and then you want to lift it. Pops over, falls down. And so I do that till it falls all the way down into the creek. And once it's down in the bottom of the creek and I feel no more roots, I reel it in and go to the next one. So you don't want it to fall down into the roots. You want it to go past No, no, I want it to fall down in. So, so if these are all roots, so there, here's a stump right here, okay? And these are all the roots scattered around this side of the tree. And the creek channel's over here. And so the drop-off is usually going to be right here at the front edge of the tree. And some of those roots are going to hang out over it. So I'm going to start right here. I'm going to hit the first root. Pop. Probably not going to be much of a fall on that one. Hit this one a little bit more fall. Hit this one, it's really going to fall all the way down to the bottom of the creek channel. And then I'm going to lift it and it's going to catch this one and I'm going to do it again. So I do let it go all the way down into the creek channel. But once I'm not hanging on those roots and popping off anymore, I'm done. I reel it in and come back. I've got to have that pause and drop to get that reaction bite. That's how I fish it. So to help you all how far past you got to throw, uh, my background before fishing was uh, a welder and a pipe fitter. Uh, so basic math with this is if you're in 10 foot of water to be able to get it at a 45 degree angle you need to throw 10 foot past the stump but if you want you know to get it just on the other side of the stump you need to throw 12 foot or 13 foot yeah. but your rule of thumb on your 45 degree angle is the same depth that you're fishing is how far past you need to throw just to kind of help y'all out so when y'all are fishing, you know how far to throw. You're not overthrowing or underthrowing. Well, and you'll figure out, if you're overthrowing, you'll figure that out real quick. And if you're underthrowing, you'll figure it out real quick. Because if you throw that jig in there and it falls, and as soon as you pick up on it, you feel roots, you didn't throw it far enough. If you throw that jig out there and you start dragging it, it takes a while to get to the roots, you threw it too far. 
So it's just that's just and you can Cody's giving you the scientific explanation. My, my mind don't work like like I'm not a mathematician. Dude. I'm a fishing guide. Like I know if I drag it too long without hitting roots, I threw it too far. You know, you know that's just how my mind works. But your mind may work mathematically, and David's kind of works more scientifically and mathematically too. I'm just the simple dummy. <laughs> I'm, I'm a visual person. person. Yeah. Yeah, that jig's gonna fall back towards you some when it hits the water. It's gonna, even if you let line out and try to let fall in slack line, it's gonna tend, and you can really see this if you use live scope, and I don't use live scope for this technique, but when you throw any bait with live scope, no matter how much slack you give that bait, it falls back towards you a little bit mm. every time, no matter what, just from the resistance of the line on the water. And, and so you do need to throw it well past the stumps for sure. And what Cody's saying, I'm sure is right. Uh, I've never thought of it like that. I just, and it, it was a hard question for me to answer when you first mentioned it. Like, yeah, we throw past it, but how far? I don't know. I just kind of feel it. You know, it's, it's a feel thing over the years. Um, but that's the biggest deal is getting it far enough past to where you start outside the roots and work into them. So that you're sneaking up. Dude, these bass are just hugged up down in those root systems, and you're creeping up on them. They don't know that jig's there, and all of a sudden it pops off, and it's in their face, and they bite. That's what I've been doing wrong. I just Pitching it to the stump. And see what happened wrong with that either though. What happens when you pitch it to the stump a lot of times, the stump's right here and you pitch it right here and it goes. And by the time it's on the bottom, you're not even at the base of the stump anymore. You gotta be really, really good. If you pitch it to the stump, you gotta let it fall about two foot and then raise the rod tip and pull a bunch of line out, free spooled, you know, but just your thumbs lightly on it and then drop the rod tip real quick to where it falls down into the root system. The downside to that is you're looking for a reaction bite immediately, and I do that a lot at certain times of the year. Yeah. He'll cover more water and bounce it off all the roots doing what he's yeah. doing at this time of the year in the cold, and the reaction bite's a lot different. When the water warms, then what you're doing is right. The perfect pitch, because I yeah. do that a lot, yeah. is six inches past the stump, six inches outside the stump, but you have to let it fall, create resistance, raise the rod tip up. Say you're in 10 foot of water, you gotta raise it up pretty good, then drop it pretty quick, so that it'll actually move back towards you a little bit, and then fall straight down into yeah. the roots. Yeah, and then, it, Dave's right, when it warms up, I do pitch more stumps, and a lot of times when it starts warming up, those fish may bite that jig before it even gets to the bottom. Right, so when, it, when the water starts warming up, those fish climb those stumps a little bit and kind of suspend on them sometimes. And sometimes they just get more aggressive, and as that jig falls, they come up to it. And so, strangely enough, today I got my lunch eight on one fish just like that in about five foot of water. Yeah. Five foot shallow, and I flipped up there by one, and, you know, the wind's blowing. When you get a windy day like this, it makes it a lot harder to feel exactly what you're doing. Yeah. I lift it up, and, and I'm looking around, you know, and I lift it up, and I'm lifted up. He hit it, and he swam straight back towards the boat. Mm -hmm. And by the time I realized it, I snapped on him, had him for a second, and he already, you know, I didn't get him hooked. The wind. He burned me. The wind, so the specific, the, the thing I'm talking to you guys about, the way we've been doing it, is very specific. Very specific. And the wind can really <laughs> hurt you. I mean, now you can, with a three-quarter ounce jig, you can do it in a pretty good wind. You really can. But if it gets to blowing, blowing, like you've got to be able to feel that jig and those roots at all times you've got to be able to feel what you're in contact with and what you're not or you're just going to waste too much time fishing dead water you've got to be able to hit the spots consistently because this is a slow methodical way to fish i mean this is slow 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 you don't cover a lot of ground you know north and south you're not going to cover two miles of creek channel doing this you're taking your time and picking apart every root system there is you know that you're hitting so it's it's time consuming deal and if the wind gets to blowing and you can't feel and you waste time in the wrong trees you're, you're going to spin your wheels and you're not going to make enough of the right cast to catch enough fish to have a good day um so it's common sense to fish the big stumps that's the next thing i was going to talk to you guys about is which stumps are the good stumps typically typically most of the time the bigger the stump which is usually a big live oak tree out here <coughs> the better right um, but I will tell you this, if I'm dragging a jig, and not all root systems are created equal, some are more covered in silt or whatever, and some aren't as exposed as others. If I'm dragging that jig, and I feel like I've gotten close enough to that tree that I sh for sure should be in the roots by now, and I'm not really feeling a good, hard, crisp root system, I pull it out, move to the next one. <coughs> I don't waste my time working all the way through that tree. If there's no roots exposed, those fish aren't going to be holding in that root system because it's just dirt. You know, they might, one might randomly, but I'm trying to have my jig in the most exposed root system for the highest percentage of the day that I can. That's my goal. Okay. 
I understand what you're talking about, but how long do you stay in the area fishing the jig, grab the stump, yeah. and you don't get a buck? Yeah, like just doing it. Yeah, how many stumps do I fish before I leave that creek yeah. kind of thing? Okay. Man, that is that is such a hard question. And we get these questions a lot, even in the springtime. How long do you stay in a pocket before you leave that pocket? How long do you stay in an area without a bite? It, there's so many variables to that. Sorry, it's, it's a very hard question to answer because it, a lot of it, you know, for us is going to depend on our history, our confidence in that area. I mean, that's the ultimate thing is, is your confidence in that area. You know, if I'm in my favorite creek channel on Lake Fork in the wintertime and I've been catching fish here all week, I'm probably going to stay there a couple hours. You know, but if I'm on a new lake, I may only last 30 minutes before I run to a new one because I don't have confidence in that creek. Um, so there's so many variables that conditions. If it's should, if it's a good day and they should be biting, I'm not going to stay as long as I would on a day where the conditions dictate that it should be tough. Because if it should be tough, I'm going to get less bites. Well, I yep. can somewhat answer that for you. I'm a little more on the technical side of it. Yeah. And you haven't mentioned yet the. When you have a creek that winds through a, a flat, all right, those fish are in a certain spot on that creek where the where the bank, old bank used to be when it falls into the creek. That has a depth of X. Let's give that depth X. What is the key depth that those fish are on? You're catching eight foot, nine foot, ten foot, eleven foot, twelve foot. Well, that's that's a day to day change too. That's so a day -to -day. that's a day to day change and right so now. So that's the next. If you we're know to really, yeah. that recently you've been catching those fish in eight to a ten foot on those big stumps on the creek, yeah. that's your answer. You fish it until you're up to seven foot. Yeah. And you fish it till you're out to twelve foot. And if you don't get no bites, go find another creek. Yep. So that's an easy way to determine. And you, if you've gone out to 12 foot where the edge is 12, and then it drops into the creek and you still haven't got, it's time to go on. Yeah. You might land into another creek that has a different yeah. water temperature there. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden that eight, nine foot range, whatever, 10 foot range is all of a sudden the ticket. Or, I mean, let's be honest on Lake Fork, you know, he's not here anymore, but uh, he passed away last year. But, you know, like for years, it's always in my head that, you know, what if Mark Pack just came through here? Like, he's yeah. the best jig fisherman I know. I'm yeah. not going to catch him behind him, you know? Like, so th there's all kinds of factors that go into those decisions of when to stay and when to go. My, my biggest deal, and David is very analytical and Cody's more analytical, and I'm probably the least analytical guy ever when it comes. I fish more by feel and gut than anything else. And so for me, my deal is... In my head, if I start thinking about something else might be better, I leave immediately. When it gets into my, like the first time I think in my head, man, this just ain't happening here. I want, I bet that, you know, they might be biting over there in White Oak or Caney or Dale. The first time I think that, strap them down, let's go. Because once for me, the way that I fish by gut and instinct and feel, <clears throat> once it's in my head, I'm not going to pick that root system apart good enough. I'm not going to take my time and set that fish up and sneak up on him the right way. I'm not going to fish the way I need to fish to catch the most fish I can. So I might as well go somewhere where I feel confident. I'll have a better chance of catching those fish anyway because I f I'm fishing better. So for me, it's just a total gut instinct thing. When it gets in my head that I need to go somewhere else, I go immediately. Now, there are days that when that pays off really well. There are also days where I run all over the lake and chase my tail and get my butt whipped, you know, because I'm just spinning out. So that's a very no. give-take deal on that. But, you know, as fishermen, we've all got to find what works for us in all these different techniques and tactics. And, um, you know, it, it's a very unique sport in that two guys can do things completely opposite and have the exact same amount of success. And that, that is we know that in fishing. You want to expand on that? Perfect exp expansion. Man, I don't, but you do. Expansion on that is. I don't expand that, on a lot of two, stuff. That's why say, you're here. You're the expansion let's guy. Let's say four days ago, when it was cold, you were still probably still catching them. Man. We were whacking them. All right. <laughs> then three days ago, we start to get warmer. All right, and you whacked them a little less. Uh, they, yesterday, how'd that go? Well, on no, the same pattern. No, no, we've had to we've had to adjust. Throughout I was the week. gonna say you had to adjust. Yeah. And here was the thing. So. What ends up happening is that four days ago, I could catch him doing the same type of thing in the same type of locations he is. But then I started the day after, the three days ago, then it wasn't as good. Got some bites, but I'm starting to think, hmm, it's water temps, you know, I mean, I saw yeah. 47 and a half to 50, and I know I got warm days coming, so decided to, uh, you know, I mean, struggled really three days ago, and then, um, 
ended up deciding that, okay, I'm going to have to change this because I think those fish have moved out of that and they're going to be up yeah. moving towards the bank is what I'm thinking. So yesterday, I'm still working some shallower type of structure like that and getting a bite here and there. But when it was in the afternoon, I thought, you know, this water temp is 53.5 right here. And I dug in the box, dug a rattle trap out and started throwing it. And that was the ticket. Huh. And literally throwing it in the dirt, throwing it in the dirt. And well, when water people. when water warms, the warmest water is going to be the shallowest water. Yeah. And so today started off early when it was cooler and got three or four bites out in in substructure like that. But when I I looked, I said, you know what? I was on the west side of the lake. The water temp was still 48 to 50 degrees. You think about the wind. The key factor that nobody factors in is that wind direction and what it's going to do to the surface water. It blows it to the east, uh, more of the south, the northeast towards the east. So it's blowing the warmer yeah. water. So I tell myself, I'm going to go to the other side of the lake and I'm going to find the pockets that have the warmest water. And that's where I'm probably going to be getting bit. So that's exactly what I did. Yeah. And I moved out of 49 degrees and within 20 minutes I was in 53.5. Right, and then I kept looking around in those areas. And I pulled that trap out, started throwing it, and catch catch one. And then I find a place where it's 55 two, and caught a five pounder. And then keep going a little bit more, and I saw 56 and a half. Caught another five pounder, and then the highest I saw was 58. Caught a four pounder and a three pounder. And so well, let's let's oh, let's talk about that. For, let, slow down just a little bit. One second. So what happens is when that water warms gradually those fish will tend to kind of move gradually right so if we're fishing 10 foot of you know creek channels are 10 foot deep and we have earlier in the week when it started gradually warming all we did was simply move up the creek to six foot of water seven foot of water whatever we just kept we just fished our way up the creek that we got bites as long as you can still get bit there and then, and then we started picking it apart but then if you get multiple days of warming or you get a more extreme warming those fish get out of that creek and they move up and then that's when they get on the flats and then so how do we know if the water is warming extreme or warming gradual Here's, how, here's my tool to make my decision on whether I stay near the channel or I run as shallow as I can get. I will actually find a decent sized pocket within a creek arm. So everybody knows Birch Creek and I'm sure everybody's figured out that half those videos were filmed in Birch Creek this week. Um, I don't know about right now because you can't idle very far back in it, but for years I can run right to this pocket, idle the back in two minutes and idle back or five minutes or whatever and idle back out. And so I use this pocket as my barometer. And it was, it was double branch, which is the first pocket past the bridge in Birch Creek. I can run right past the bridge, shut down, idle the back of that sucker, and idle back out. If the back of double branch was six, seven, eight degrees warmer than the middle of Birch Creek, like we, we got to go get in the dirt. You know, if the back of double branch was only like two degrees warmer, we just need to shift up the creek. So I would, and I would encourage you guys to do that on whatever lake you're on for these warming trends, is find yourself a measuring pocket. Well, we're just going to name it that, a measuring pocket, right? Like, let's measure how much it's warming. I've seen the back of Double Branch be as high as 10, 11, 12 degrees warmer than the boat lane. Now, that's the most extreme case. But if I get up to around 5 degrees warmer in the back of Double Branch than the middle of the creek, that's when we need to transition and get away from that creek. But if it's only a couple degree difference, you can stay with that creek. You just move the shallower segments of it. Um, and that's kind of how I've done it for years. But uh, no doubt, David, I know you want to talk about this. The thing about yesterday when I started doing that, and looking because I was going to the side of the lake where the wind was blowing the the surface layer is warmer about that much yeah when you get the waves and the wind it pushes that water that's a big right? deal that is a big it deal. it is a big deal it pushes that water and the direction it's going is where you need to go and so yeah. I got over into an area at a pocket but the pocket was at a 45 degree angle to the way the wind was blowing and at the mouth of the pocket it was 53.5 and mind you I'm coming out of 49 degrees so uh, I I threw it some stumps, no bites, no bites. I picked up that trap and started throwing it, started throwing it, boom, catch a four pounder and then catch another one, all right? And I thought, well, here we go, game on. So I started throwing the dirt, working back. Well, when I got to the back of the pocket, the water was 51 degrees in the back of the pocket. It was colder in the back than it was up at the front. Now, why do you think that is? Because the wind didn't have the impetus on the back of the creek that it had on the front because of the way the, way the creek set. And so that's where the warmer water and that's where the bites were. 
And interestingly enough, in the back where the water was 51, there was shad activity back there, but I didn't get a bite back there, right? That was the weird thing. Today, mind you, when I got and started hitting it, shad were everywhere. I could see them on the graph, and then all of a sudden about four o'clock, the shad started flicking everywhere. All of a sudden you'd see a roll on it. And that's when the water was 55, 56 degrees in that area. And so the shad were the key to that. You better have a trap. And I'm throwing a chrome trap too. Not a red one, chrome one. And that was a big ticket. They wouldn't hit a red, but they hit the chrome. Well, the sun was out. The sun, because the sun was out and the water wasn't muddy. Yep. So, and yeah. So yeah, normally that norm was a big ticket, a big, big good, good decision. Normally we'd be throwing that red trap in some grass. Well, there ain't no grass right now. Yeah. Mm -mm. So you're there ain't no grass right now. <laughs> it, you know the two key things on on the water warming is that what Davis talking about the wind, but then the, the sun angle can play a little bit of a role too. So with no wind, with no wind, the water that's going to warm the most throughout the day is where the sun hits first. Well, in the winter time, this time of year, the sun's well south of us, as far about as far south of us as it gets. You know, a little less, but almost. So the sun is shining in a northerly direction. And the first corners that get sunlight are the northwest corners. And that's kind of an old adage of, of bass fishing is, you know, the northwest corners are where they spawn first, where they warm. And that's why that is, because that's where the sunlight hits first in the morning is in that northwest corner. So the ultimate like warming trend scenario is get that warming trend temperature wise and then get you a southeast wind to the blow the warm surface water into the corner that gets the sunlight first. Like that's when it just really gets warm quick. But um, yeah, where that wind blows is something that I actually didn't pick up on until a few years ago. That is a big key piece of information because there are oddball scenarios where you may have a warming trend but have a northeast wind. Maybe it's not a hard northeast wind, but there are some weird random days where you may have a easterly or northeasterly wind or something odd that you don't normally have with a warming trend temperature wise. And if that sun's beating down on that water, warming up and it's blowing that water to the Southwest, you better go over there to the South. You know what I mean? Like it's gonna be warmer over there and, and minding your water temperature. Water temperature is not, people ask me all the time, what's the water temp when they get in my boat? They're like, what's the water temp? I'm like, I don't know, who cares? <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like most of the year, it's <clears throat> not that big a deal. But right now, you better watch it every few minutes. Like it can make, especially if you're getting out of the creek channel and fishing shallow, that is maybe the most important factor without there being grass in this lake is going to be water temperature. It, right? Would y'all would you say, I mean, David, what do you think? I think it's going to be the most important factor right now. The water temp? For shallow water fish in the Absolutely. water. Absolutely. Yeah. That's exactly what I was looking for. What I was going to say too is, is that the, when that water warms, then they adapt to structure differently when the water's warming. Yeah, no doubt. Versus when the water is 48 degrees, and I was back studying records from 10, 12 years ago, a couple of nights ago, and I was looking at water temperatures, lake level and all that, and how it compares to now in order to make decisions. I've got a big tournament here in two weeks, and uh, and you know trying to, to get pinned in on what I wanna do, and when you can digest that information and then go to certain locations and see how those fish are setting up at the moment at that water temperature, okay? And so, uh, I we gotta give him some time here, but one other thing. Last year this happened, and this is something you need to put in your arsenal and don't do without it. The, today the wind had more west to it than it had yeah. anything, all right? Whenever the wind has due south, all right, la last year we had a couple of instances where we had three warm days like this, big wind, 20 miles an hour. What it was doing is heating that surface, but a lot of these pockets on this lake are north facing pockets. So when you get a south wind, it's blowing that warm water into those pockets. Figured that out going in there and we were throwing stuff in those pockets, but we could use a Texas rig or a little Carolina rig or uh, a swim jig. And dude, it was game on. I'm talking catching 20, 30, 40 a day. As soon as that wind changed from any direction but south, forget it, they were gone. So I mean gone. Speaking of that, I wanted to show you guys one more bait. Um, because that, that is what, what we're going to deal with right now for the next probably month, month and a half, till we really get spawning fish all over the lake, you know, at the end of March, early April. Um, you're going to deal with the creek channel stuff that we've talked in depth on with the jig. And you can throw other baits in there. You, you can throw a Texas rig crawl in there. You can throw a drop shot in there if you want to. It'll work too. Um, I like the jig. You're going to catch bigger fish on the jig than anything else. Um, but the other thing that when they get into this warming cycle when that warming trend happens and you got to go get shallow okay 
there's a lot of baits that can work when they do that. You can throw a jerk bait, you can throw a spinner bait, you can throw a trap, you can throw uh, the movement ADX is probably my favorite bait with the lake in the shape it's in right now with all the cover being hard. <coughs> there's no grass of any kind, shoreline or nothing, uh, with the lake being dropped like it was this winter. So that movement ADX is going to bounce off anything in this lake right now and generate some of those same reaction bites that we like to talk about. Uh, so I love shallow diving crankbaits that deflect off cover real hard when the fish get in the dirt. But maybe, maybe the best technique. Now this is a, this is a dauber deal. This, you got to go slow. It's old school, man. It's old school. And David just mentioned it. Small Carolina rig, finesse Carolina rig. Yeah, with a lizard, or if you want to be modern with it, you can use the hog walla from Six Sense, which is a cross between a lizard and a creature bait. But again, don't overthink the color. Black with blue flake will get you all you want. I mean, it just just like the jig. I mean, I, I don't know what it is about black and blue this time of year. Another thing that works phenomenal in that shallow water when they get out of that creek when they first get out of it, is a black and blue stick bait, a Senko style bait. You can use the clout from six cents like I do. You can use your preference, Yum Dinger, Yamamoto, whatever. But a five inch Senko style stick bait, just rigged weightless on a three or four out EWG style hook, will bust them up, man. But black and blue is the color. Even on the like sunny day, it doesn't, for me, it doesn't matter. Like sunny, dark, it don't just throw black and blue this time of year. It just works. But I'll take a lizard or this little hog wall of creature bait's the one I'm using. Uh, and I'll pass some of these around. You guys can check them out. Yeah, hey, y'all can steal them. I don't care. Uh, here, just pass the bag around and take one until we run out. There you go. But I'll take that, and then this is the gear. And all the gear that I'm showing you guys rig this up with is six cents. And I'm not, I'm not telling you to go buy this. You can have EWG style hooks of whatever brand you want. You can have bobber stoppers and weights of whatever brand you want. What I will tell you is like everything with six cents, you're not going to find any, any better than these on the market. I, I can stand behind that and know that I'm telling you the truth. Um, Start with an eight ounce, eighth ounce to a quarter ounce weight, right? Next, you're going to get your bobber stop out. Does everybody know how bobber stops work? Slide your line in there and pop it. It's on the line, right? So you're going to put one, or maybe if you have a problem with the weight slide, and you usually won't with an eighth or quarter ounce weight, but if you do, use two and it'll stop it. But just put one of those bobber stops below that weight. You're going to slide that up about 18 inches is what I like to do, give or take. And I'm going to tie on a three or four aught EWG style hook. And this is the six inch stout EWG is the one I'm using. Uh, it's a heavy, heavy wire hook. Um, you can probably get away with using a lot of wire if you want to. This time of year in pre-spawn, the average size fish we catch is so big that I'm oversizing gear. And even though that only weighs that, I'm throwing that on a 7.3 heavy. <laughs> But again, guys, the rods that I'm using are so light and they're made of graphene. And that's the big deal that I told you guys about earlier. They're so light that I can overpower my rods and throw them, throw these light baits on there. Uh, if you having a hard time or you want, you know, just more simple casting, about a 7-1 medium heavy is about the right size rod to use for this technique. But make you a little 18-inch leader, make a finesse Carolina rig and put you a black and blue creature bait, lizard style creature bait on there. That don't get talked about anymore. But yeah, I grew up doing that. My dad, we used to split, we call it split shot back in. You take them little crimp weights, you know, mm -hmm. you crimp them on your line. Same deal we're doing now, only we don't damage the line, you know, because we got these bobber stops, so we don't damage our line. Even, you know, because listen, you hook a nine or 10 pounder and you got that crimp weight on it, that's where you're going to break off at, right there, <laughs> where that weight's crimped on there. So um, we've all experienced that over the years, I'm sure. But that little technique right there, get up on those sunny flats, and especially once you've gotten a bite or two, clean up with that thing. What do you think? Ozio, Cody? You know anything about that? I'm just here to make y'all look pretty. Man. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm no, that, that is You look like you spent an hour and a half grooming that beard before you got here, dude. That thing's all trimmed up and combed. Mine's look like it's been wind blown all day. <laughs> you know, I, I do still work during the week some, so I have some. To Every once in a while you gotta be presentable. That's huh? right. That's uh, right. David, you, you mentioned that finesse Carolina. What are your thoughts on that? I'll use that. That's that's on laying on the deck of my boat. I use it today. You probably rig it up differently now, though, don't you? You probably you on a lighter rod. Six pound. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> no. I actually use it on uh, the, the main line is seventeen, but I put a swivel and you put a swivel. Okay. I put a I put a thirty five pound, a real small swivel, and then I'll put the uh, the weight, a quarter ounce weight, and then I'll put the bobber stop in front of that. Because if you put like a hog wallow on that and you try to cast it, the light the bait's going to uh, take away some of the aerodynamicness. 
yep. and it's going to make the weight slide up the uh, the line. You're right. I forgot to mention. I do. I put a bobber on top. So I put a bobber stop on first, then the weight, then yeah. the next bobber stop. Yeah. Because especially on the Carolina rig, when you're throwing like a a brush hog and with a one ounce weight or a three quarter ounce weight, a lot of times and the wind's blowing, it's going to create the drag and the deck gun weight wants to slide up the line. So I'll end up sometimes with a one ounce weight on a Carolina rig. I'll put two of those bobber yep. stops up Above in it. front of it, it to yeah. keep it from, so I can fly it uh, as long as I can throw it with no problem with the okay. line going up. That's a, uh, that's a deadly, I'm telling you, that's a deadly little technique that just, you know, I, I get so excited about things like that. And then I come over here and tell all y'all, which probably shouldn't do, but um, I get excited about things that, that like people forget about, right? Like people, people just forget about things over the years and, it's like in the fall, every fall I get on a bite with like a seven inch ribbon tail worm. And it's like, nobody throws that. Who throws a seven inch ribbon tail worm anymore? Hardly anybody, I know that he does, but not a lot of people do anymore. And so it's like every fall they get on this little worm bite and it's like, I get excited. It's the same deal with this little finesse Carolina rig. It's like, people do throw finesse Carolina rigs, but they don't throw a lizard on there anymore. Yeah. You know what I mean? They just don't. And, and it, God dang, it's worked since I can remember. And when I was a little bitty kid, we were catching them on it and it still works today and like, Nobody ever mentions that is the bait that's working. You know, if they're throwing a Finesse Carolina rig, it's with a uh, ring fry or something, or a bubble fry or whatever, you know, something like that. It's never a lizard. Yeah. Um, well, one thing you've got to take away from tonight, if anything, you learn anything, one thing tonight is water temperature yeah. and where no it is on the lake, it's important. It's important. according to how the wind's blowing. And you shouldn't have days where, uh, like you said, you didn't get a bite. You haven't got any bites in a couple times out and you're just in the wrong place at the wrong time because if that one thing alone can take and push water so far away that that water gets cold and I don't know where those fish go. He's better at, at that deep stuff and, and pinpointing those things on those creeks, but those things will draw way back in that type of situation. And they're no longer up in something that I feel is catchable uh, on, yeah. c on certain parts of the lake at the wrong time. Mm, definitely. More of a shallow water fishing? Me? No. No, I fish, he fishes offshore I fish, more than I do. I fish offshore. That's my favorite, really. But I've, I'm super versatile because I fish tournaments. And you have to be versatile to fish tournaments and do everything. I mean, January here, I won two tournaments back-to-back -back quite a few years ago, uh, fishing in 35 foot of water uh, with a drop shot, of course. But, uh, uh, and, but I mean, that at that time of the year is a tremendous way to catch them and the strange thing about that is is that that's in january when you get up to the first two weeks in february with this tournament's coming up next week those fish won't be there yep. in that at that depth anywhere from 22 25 to 35 they're gone probably i, I think that probably has to do with daylight period so regardless yeah. of what the water temperatures do frustrating regardless of what the water temperatures do these fish understand the calendar through the daylight period so however long the sun shines throughout the day, it's growing every day right now. We know that. Um, and when that starts happening, those fish know we're getting there, like it's coming. And, and so even if the water is cold and staying cold and getting colder, they will start transitioning and moving into different areas of the lake to go into pre-spawn mode and to get ready to be ready to spawn. Um, so something like what David's talking about there, fish in January, 35 foot of water, then by February they're gone. To me, that's just, regardless of water temperature, that's just a daylight period thing. Because I mean, the days are getting longer. I'll tell you, I'll tell you how. since that somehow, I don't I, know. I'll tell you how, I've really, over the last year, really started to put a lot more faith in the daylight period situation. That is these fish's calendar. It's the only thing they have to know what day it is, so to speak. Um, and they just, everything they do is just instinctual. You know, they don't have critical mm -hmm. thinking capabilities, obviously. But I'll tell you how important it is. When we've had these power plant lakes, that have been shut down over the last three, four, five years, right? Y'all realize these fish still spawn in January and February like they did when there was heat? Two years after there was no, two, three years after there was no heat on Fairfield? Go there and the water's 53 to 55 degrees and they're spawning? Like we're catching them off a of bed, looking at them, sight fishing. Like I'm going along fishing the outside edge of the grass with a jerk bait and I see an orange spot up on the bank and I'm like, that looks an awful lot like a brand new bed. And then as I'm looking at it, one swims across it, I'm like, no way. And I mean, we're struggling, you know, cause we're fishing outside. And I ease up there and that fish just won't post up on that bed, flip in there and catch it. And now we start looking for beds and catch them all over the lake spawning <laughs> on Lake Fairfield two years, at least two years after they turn the heat off. They're out there in February spawning in 53 degree water. 
and it hadn't gotten warmer than that previously. It's not like they came in on warmer conditions and then were still there after the water cooled off. It hadn't been warm before that. So these fish rely on that daylight period to tell them when to do their thing in a big, big, I think a much bigger way than we give them credit for. So How yeah, they're going to do the beds this year with all the grass coming. Well, you just get next to a stump. <clears throat> I mean, I've, I've fished this lake, sight fished this lake when it was low, you know, from 2011 to, I guess, 14 or so, 2014 or so. Um, actually, <laughs> yeah, sight fishing is going to be phenomenal this year. I mean, it's going to be unbelievable. I mean, you can see them all. You, you know, there's a lot of fish when the lake's grassy that you'd never see. They get so far back in the flooded junk, you don't know they're there. You know, you can't get to them. You pretty well get to all of them now. I mean, you know what I mean? It's You're going to be able to, when they start spawning all over this mid lake and south, you'll be able to see every fish that's on a bed. Um, so, no, sight fishing is going to be unbelievable. Now, the only thing bad long term for the fishery is those fry are going to get hammered. Mm -hmm. You know, the fry are not going to have a very good survival rate this year unless the water comes up real quick. Mm -hmm. So, uh, we are not, we are going to have, you know, some year classes of fish where we don't have as many fish, you know, five eight years from now that could happen but if the lake stays down long enough to replenish the nutrients on the bank before it comes up when it comes up the lake will be so fertile that we won't notice that missing year class because the other year classes will do so well <coughs> they will they will obviously i mean we, we've been through this scenario right like we've seen this movie before not that long ago out here even lower than it was now and stayed there for three years and then when the lake came up yeah, all those fry classes got decimated, but uh, when the lake came back up and we actually had grass popping up all over the lake, we caught fish all over the lake. You know, it, it was just the lake was very fertile. The fish were very healthy. And we were catching them all, and it was fine. These suckers are hardy, man. They can handle it. They can handle it well. So um, what do you think about that? And I want to I talk about this a little bit more, Nip, because we're going to have, you know, the Creek Channel deal covers when it's cold and cold trending. And we've talked a lot about this warm trending deal. But on techniques, that little finesse Carolina rig and a Senko will get you by as far as slow baits go. But there's you, you're gonna, especially on the windier days, you're gonna have times where you're gonna have to wind them. You know, you're gonna have to bang some stumps. And you talked about the little shallow diving crankbait deal. That Movement 8X is my favorite one. But man, here's another bait that gets kind of forgotten with the invention of a chatterbait. But big black. All right then. Having Halloween down there. Uh, big bladed spinnerbaits, guys. And this is a, hey, Lake Fork specifically is a spinnerbait lake. These fish eat a spinnerbait on this pond. Low water, high water grass. No, it doesn't matter. When the lake was low, we caught them on a spinnerbait. When the, we had grass, we caught them on a spinner. This is a spinner. It's kind of like it's a jig lake. It's a spinnerbait lake. It really is. Uh, these fish out here love them. And you can take a bigger bladed spinnerbait and kind of banging around on stumps, almost like a crankbait. Mm -hmm. What do you think, Dick? That's an old school deal. What do you think? Yeah, well, that's the same pattern. I've been, See how when we talk about old school, I throw it to I was <laughs> fishing today. I was, you bring that up, and I mean, I didn't tie one on, but that's, I could have very well done that because the flashing of those double willow leaves or, yeah. or whatever the case, I was throwing a chrome trap, you know, so yeah. it's not much different. And the beauty of it is, even better, is that you can roll it way slower. Yeah. Way well, slower. and the bigger blade you use on your spinnerbait, the slower you can fish it. I've actually got one that, uh, three eight ounce chartreuse and white spinnerbait that I upsized the willow blade to a number six, yeah, which is huge. And there's only kind of one brand that I found that I can throw in it. It doesn't roll when you put the right. that big of a blade on there. It's War Eagle. So yeah. I use a chartreuse and white War Eagle. It's got that orange blade on the front and a gold will on the back. Well, I take that number four and a half, I think it is that it comes with off, put a number six on, and the reason I do that. Yeah, it's bigger and it creates a little more thump, a little more whatever. But really, the reason I do that is because I can slow it down. And now, again, what do I have? I've got movement without very much movement. Right. I mean, that spinnerbait's just creeping in the shallow water, yeah. but it's going thump, You thump, can fish thump, a heavier thump. spinnerbait, too, mm -hmm. with a big willow leaf like that because the willow leaf creates lift. Yep, that's what I mean, yeah. It and that's why you can slow lift. it down. And so yeah. You can slow it down even Wait with up. a half ounce or a five eighths or a three quarter. Even mm -hmm. I like to throw three quarters in water up to four foot. I mean, because that blade's going to lift, and so I can slow yeah. that down. But yet, if it's windy, I can still throw it a mile. Yeah, that so three eighths one. Heavier, that that three eighths one is blade. that three eighths one is for fishing in yeah that deep of water. Exactly. 
you know, and I can really slow it down in that really shallow, shallow water when we get those good warming trends when they get in the dirt. I'm about to start doing that. I, I'm glad you brought that up. <laughs> that totally skipped my mind. Uh, yeah, that spinnerbait <laughs> deals. Are, and, and Dave was talking about double wheel, and I, I like the big thumper, you know, oh. white spinnerbait with a big, just single Colorado blade. The, so old the water's thumpers. real dirty, really, really Man. chocolatey. Come on. That works. They, they eat that sucker out here. They do eat that thing yeah. out here. Jump in. Bring it. Give us your. Thing? Give us your wisdom. You haven't given <laughs> us enough wisdom. Well, hang on. go ahead, Cody. Oh. Wait on. Everybody's waiting on you. All right. Well, I mean, yeah, the spinnerbait. I mean, y'all just y'all are talking about everything that I'm, I'm doing. We're doing too good of a so job. We're covering it all for you. Is, so I'm like the third wheel here. Like you are. Like we're on a date. You know? Third wheeling. No, it's all good. We'll um, bring Charlie up here. He can be the fourth wheel. We'll go four wheeling. There you we'll go. go. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, the only thing I can add that y'all haven't talked about is maybe going into the pre-spawn to the spawn. I don't know yeah. if you want to discuss that right now, but because in the pre-spawn, they're going to start pushing up into the secondary points as well. And that was in a place uh, right off of a main creek, which is, I think it's one of these little small feeder creeks that dump into the main, and it has a two foot differential between the bank yeah. and the bottom of the creek, and it had stumps on it. So I was working those stumps. Um, there was another guy in a, in a boat there, he was doing the same thing. And so he had the right idea with that little secondary small ditch. And it, it was a creek because it wound back and forth like this in an area, you know. So those can, can be extremely valuable also. Yeah, absolutely. And the shallower the fish get, the smaller the depth change needs to be to be significant. Mm -hmm. Like the shallower those fish get, you like a one to two foot deal can be a big deal. Like when out in 10 foot of water, you need like a three or four foot drop off to really be the one the fish are holding on. But when you get in the dirt, like a one to two foot drop off can be a big deal, like a really big deal. Yeah, and if the, pay attention to the water color because if the water color is, if you can see down two feet, then that shallower deal might not be nearly no, as good yeah. when the water's cold, you know, just because the water's so clear. But if the, you can't see down more than four or five inches, then on a sunny day, those yeah. fish will get up, like I said, like today, I was talking about in the dirt. Yeah, dirty, dirtier water to the shallower for the most and part. And now that so. well, I'm thinking about it, the guys who won the tournament at Sam Rayburn last weekend for a hundred grand, uh, the guy that I'm fishing with next weekend, his friend <clears throat> knew those guys, and that's exactly what they were doing. They were throwing it in the dirt with a chatterbait. They said one cast, he threw up there, and a fish swirled up almost on the bank, and literally in 10 inch, 15 inches of water, and he reeled in, threw it back up there, seven pounds. Well, man, speaking of chatterbait, you had a question about chatterbait, I think, a minute ago. I heard you say chatterbait. I didn't know what else you said. Y'all were talking about thumps. Yeah. And I, chatterbait. Chatterbait pops your mind. Right. Got sure. Much. So much vibration. Yeah. So it, it, I'm not going to tell you that a chatterbait won't get you bit out here right now or, or going forward, especially on warm trends. It probably will. What I will tell you is it will also catch them trees. <laughs> like a chatterbait, a chatterbait hangs timber pretty bad, right? It's a grass bait or open water bait. You don't really want to be rolling chatterbaits around heavy timber. Um, you're just going to be hung up too much. And so, so much of our decisions in fishing, and I think this is something else that gets underrated and isn't, isn't common knowledge enough. We all get hung up on a, well, they're biting a square bill, or well, they're biting a spinnerbait, or well, they're, they're biting a chatterbait. The reality is they'll probably bite some of all three, right? Like if they're biting one, they'll probably bite the other two as well. So really the decision comes down to what can I fish the most efficiently? So confidence. so yes, with confidence, but most of but what can I fish most efficiently? So if I'm in a flat that's full of timber, okay, instead of throwing a chatterbait, I'm gonna lean towards a square bill or a spinnerbait because I can fish yeah. it without getting hung up as much. Yeah. So the same fish that's gonna buy a chatterbait probably bite that spinnerbait, most of them, you know, a lot of them. So I'm gonna throw that spinnerbait, that way I'm not spending half my time fetching my bait. Yeah. You understand what I'm saying? Key word there is efficiently. Mm -hmm. It's like like Today, at one spot, I pulled up and there was a row of trees right off the bank, a, a mud bank, and I threw up there right on the edge of the trees with a trap and caught a five pounder. All right, I was like, well, I was, took a picture, da, 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 da. so I'll throw him back, and then I get back at my next cast. I threw back up in there, caught an under, back to back cast, and I thought, well, look at this. So I pick up a chatterbait, thinking that, you know what, I'm gonna explore this in there with a chatterbait, never got a bite. Matter of fact, I didn't get a bite on a chatterbait today but I could throw up there with a trap and get them to bite it, but they wouldn't bite the chatterbait. Now, why that is, is unexplainable. Yeah, the, uh, I just, you know, I, we all get hung up on making decisions on bait selection. I mean, that's a huge part of this game. That's why you guys are here, part of the reason you guys are here, part of the reason y'all watch some of the videos we make, and we've all read fishing reports 
from way back when, years ago, before the internet existed, trying to make decisions on bait selection. In reality, I think that our bait selection decision needs to be simplified into what can I fish the most effectively and efficiently in that cover that I'm in. Like, let's make our decision on where we're going to fish, then let's analyze what cover's there, what baits can we fish efficiently in that cover. Uh, I think that's, for me, that's what it's become over the years is that's, I love throwing a chatterbait. Everybody knows chatterbait's my favorite. Chatterbait's my favorite. I use it on river a lot. But you're probably not going to find a chatterbait on the deck of my boat very often this pre-spawn period on Lake Fork. Normally by now, I've been throwing a chatterbait every day. I haven't thrown it once. Not once. Because when I go into a shallow area, I see what calls for a square bill or, you know, a spinnerbait or, or whatever. I'm not, I'm not throwing chatterbait. Uh, jerk bait. I mentioned jerk bait earlier. Jerk bait is going to be real effective. It's effective right now too, uh, especially when they when it warms and they get outside of the creeks. Jerk bait is going to be huge when they pull up on those points, like Cody was referring to. Jerk bait is going to be huge, and most of the time it's going to be that three to five, six foot diving style jerk bait. The Provoke 106X will be the one I'm using. But just to prove to you guys, I don't only talk about six cents baits. <laughs> Now, it's getting hard to not talk about their baits with anything because they make so much stuff now, and it's also good. But I don't always just talk about six cents. When those fish get warm trended and get shallow like we've been talking about, when that bite happens and they get in the dirt, <clears throat> the old floating rogue. The old rattling rogue, the floating one. Now, you got to be careful. Don't get the suspending one. I mean, they have the suspending one, but there's better suspending jerk baits than a rogue. There is. Not that that old rogue won't catch some fish. There's just better modern jerk baits than a suspending rogue. But that old floating rogue, that's a bad dude now. You take that sucker, twitch it two or three times, let it flow back up. Twitch it two or three times, let it flow back up. And when they get shallow, shallow, you want to talk about something that people don't really talk about or throw a lot anymore that'll just, I mean, catch every fish in the pond, Jack. And you can be, a, like, fast with it. You can cover water. Isn't it crazy, though, how, how you stop using baits and you don't even know why? I got a million of them, and I probably hadn't thrown one of those in years that old floating rogue i've got a jerk bait box that's full of nothing but six inch jerk baits except for about five of them and they sit right up there in the top row and they wait on a warming trend in the pre-spawn <laughs> that's the only time the they come out got, it's full of rattling rogues yeah it's full of all different colors yeah the old floating rogue is a is a, yeah. is a humdinger on them warming trends guys any questions so sunday yeah fish are back yeah if I showed up Sunday, I would have nothing but a jig on deck of my boat. The way they've been buying a jig lately, you'd be hard-pressed to get me to make a cast with anything else. And Monday, for sure, because this could be in the 70s again. Well, now, Mon now, Monday, when it gets back in the 70s, now, now my options are going to open up a little bit, right? But with water cooling tonight, cooling all day tomorrow, cooling all night, Saturday night going into Sunday, Sunday I'm going to be back into those creek channel edges, and I'm going to be throwing nothing but a jig. Mm -hmm. it and yeah. We got another cool front Wednesday. Yeah. So we're gonna have, but but with that's Wednesday night that that blows in, mm -hmm. guys. I'm gonna tell you something. I don't know how many y'all off during the week you gonna you want to fish Wednesday. Okay. You want to fish Wednesday because we've got the two nights before that are in the mid 50s, and I know Wednesday we got kind of some nasty weather. Probably gonna have a ton of wind. But if you can get out and fish on Wednesday, if y'all are listening out there, it, wherever you're at, if you can go fish this Wednesday, go fish this Wednesday. That's gonna be one of them warm trend days where those fish are going to get up on the bank and they're going to bite. One thing I want to tell you all about, his, about the jigs, do not be like me and be an idiot or a procrastinator. Retie the jig several times. Yes. That root system. You got to retie them. You will make an idiot's mistake like I did with him a couple of weekends ago and lose a good one. Yeah, um, yeah, it's high impact. It's you're you're running your line through nasty cover. Those fish, a lot of times, are eating the whole jig and rubbing their teeth on it. And these hook sets are high impact hook sets. They're tangled up in the roots. Sometimes you're putting a lot of stress on your line. Yeah, you got to re. Very good point. Thank you for bringing that. You have to retie a lot when you're throwing that jig down there. A lot. Does that wood eat on that on that floor top part? No, it, some of it will. You know, some of it just depends. Sometimes it gets in a little split groove or something, and that's not good. Gets on some bark, that's not good. But mainly, it's you know, like you set the hook on a fish, and he's got you wrapped around something, and now he's got his weight. And like every fish you set the Guys, I will tell you this, in about a month, month and a half, I've seen two unders, you know, under 16-inch fish. I had a buddy of my fish tournament text me this week, asked me if I've been catching any unders, I knew where any unders were hanging out. I said, dude, I've seen two unders in like a month. 
I mean, every fish we swing on is four pounds or bigger. Just about for a month straight, it's been wild. But when you set the hook on a four or five pounder or bigger, and he's got you wrapped around something, he stresses that line. And like I said, they're eating this jig right now. I've posted a picture, y'all have seen it on some of the videos. Half of them are getting the whole jig in their mouth, so their teeth, while you're fighting them, their teeth are rubbing the line. And you're putting so much stress on that, that snap hook set with those bigger fish right below you, you're putting so much stress on the hook set. If you have a bad spot in your line, it's, it's gonna snap on the on the hook set. Them unders are hard to find right now. I mean, twenty pound floor I've been looking for them staunchly uh, for next weekend, and uh, man, I, I it's just a struggle. I'd be interested to see how that tournament tomorrow is going to turn out and what it takes. That's going to be a tough one tomorrow. Wait, wait. What's Didn't, tomorrow, JC? J, uh, no, it's uh, Media Bass. <clears throat> With that cool down blowing in tonight and cooling throughout the day tomorrow, that's going to make, like, tomorrow's going to be a tough day. Tomorrow's going to be one of the days that's going to be real tough because some of those fish that pulled out on the bank are going to have to suck back in and they ain't going to be there yet. You know, and they're not going to be biting yet for sure. Yeah. And then by Sunday, you'll probably be able to make that jig deal work, I think. But I would definitely stick to that jig deal on Sunday. Better right now, I know mean, you probably been talking about this end up here around Birch and up here. What about Cheney? Yeah, no, I've been down there. I mean, yeah, no, we've we've been all over the lake, honestly. I mean, I, the videos half videos were filmed, but part of the videos were filmed way down there, you know. And so we've been, you know, Vic was with me Monday or last Monday. Last Monday. Last Monday. Yeah, I mean, we we literally went from Running Creek to Birch and hit places in between. I mean, we've been in. You know, all over the lake. Glade, Long Branch, anything Running on. Creek, Dale, Ray. I mean, we've been in all of them, you, you know. you got to figure, anything on the west side of the lake is always going to be colder. Colder. And it's a good five degrees. Typically, difference. typically. Hey, Cheney, I was down there. And uh, it's, uh, that water's still in the 47, 48. But, yes, but for the jig bite, though, colder's not always. No, yeah, and that works for that. Sometimes colder's better. And that works exactly for I'll that. I'll be honest with you, the time when that jig bite's yeah. the best is when it's been cold for three or four days. Like when it's been real cold for three or four days, give all them fish a chance to get in that creek channel. Yeah. Um, that the more fish pile in that creek channel, the more you catch. And look for them brush piles this weekend too. Like Cause I said, it, it's gonna hold heat. Yeah. yeah. Question for you: You mentioned Wednesday. Go fishing Wednesday. Wednesday is full moon. Even better. That's even better. So yeah. So come on. Uh, you know. We're gonna have a little warming cycle into a full moon in February. You know, these are the things that Sherry Lunkers are made of, right? Mm -hmm. Like that's what that is. Okay. That's that's the day, dude. I'm telling you, this Wednesday's the first day. Well, this Wednesday's the first day that I've looked at with the weather and everything lined up, and I went, man, that's gonna be nasty if you're out there when that storm blows through. If you're out there when the front flips and rolls through, it, it's gonna get a little sketchy out here. But that's gonna be the day. Like that's the first one I've seen line up, and I'm like, mm, there she is. You know. I do mm. want to share something about the full moon. Okay. So my my granddaddy was a guy out here in the late '80s, early '90s, uh, up into the, the late '90s. Same time David started. Grandpa. <laughs> in fact, David David gave him his first trip. <laughs> David brought him into the business. <laughs> Does this mean anything? <laughs> Number one. But whether, whether or not this is you know 100% accurate, this is just what the man told me. Your, your crawfish will spawn three days before, three days after on a full moon. Oh, the pink will spawn will be on the oh. full moon night and day. Stop it. On these clay hardened points. So these fish it. are going to be feeding on these crawfish. So creature bait. Sounds like I'm going to get me a crawfish colored flat sided square bill and get after it come Wednesday. <laughs> Golly. I mean, that's what he always told me, you know. That's great. Uh, and you were talking about the black and blue. You know, I know I've brought this up on the videos before. But in the, in the wintertime, your, your crawfish change colors. Oh, yeah. Because the grass dies, that's where they get their nutrients from. Right. So, they, and they turn to a blue tint, a bluish yep. blackish tint. So that's why that color is so good. And I think that color's gonna be good throughout the year further this year because there's not gonna no be grass. grass. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah, yeah, there was a good YouTube video on that about the crawfish changing color and times of the year in which they uh, They do. They turn black and blue in the wintertime and then when they spawn when they spawn, which is right before the bass spawn, green, right? They turn red. They get oh, red. Mm -hmm. They get red. And, and so we think about well, right before the bass spawn we're throwing pre spawn baits, we're all throwing these red colored baits. Well there you go. Right, wintertime we're throwing a black and blue jig. Closer we get to spawn, we throw that red crawfish colored stuff and uh, closer to the spawn. Yeah, right. right. Yeah. 
But I mean, you know, we say all that. We say all that. Hell, sometimes I throw a red and orange trap in the fall and catch them. So you know. Well, but also there, there's too, always the, the there's always the aspect of a bass has a pea sized brain. Like there's always that aspect. And the thing about Rayburn in that case, because we put bigger fish in the live well, is is that invariably there's always crawfish pinchers in the live well. Always. Yeah. Yep. So another thing, talking about red, it reminded me. Right now, have, have y'all fished any this week? Caught any bass? Uh, so not on pork. I've been on pounds twice this week. All right. So what color is, it, is their gum line where their teeth are? Is it white or is it red? Well, it's a red in the wintertime. No, not always. Usually. But when my granddad, this is another old wise tale probably, yeah. but when the teeth are red, he always said they're biting red. And I, and I, I on the bass. Mm -hmm. Really? Yep. I'm going to have to check that out now. <laughs> you know, well, it's supposed to be an indicator of eating crawfish, right? Yep. You know what else I think it has to do with, Cody? And, and I think, uh, not to not to try and get scientific, like I say I'm not, but... <laughs> You're not qualified. Not, I'm not qualified for this, for this statement. <laughs> so, when, that's blood in there, mm -hmm. right? That's blood. It's not, a, it's not like paint from the crawfish that's not what it is it's blood in their gum line in there where their teeth are i think what that is is they're you know everything in the cold water gets harder they're eating crawfish they're eating bait fish too but the bait fish get even harder the crawfish are extremely hard and i think what happens is they're eating those harder baits and they so they get some blood coming to that area but they're cold and and so the blood doesn't circulate and move around as much and it just stays in their mouth so like it, it's a bruise it's a bruise that won't heal because the blood's not circulating. Yeah, it's a chance to look as good ones today too. I never noticed that. that that's no, they, me, they all put that lipstick on in the wintertime, dude. They do. I mean, not every one of them, but for the most part, them bass, you, they're wearing lipstick. Them big old fat girls got their lipstick on. Dude. They're, trying, they're going out on the town, baby. They're trying to look good. They're about to go try to get a boyfriend. Dude. They got to put their lipstick on, you know? Yeah. Come on. Hmm. Have y'all seen how fat the fish are out here this year? I, wow. These are This is as fat as I've ever seen Lake Fort Bass in my life. I mean, these fish, I mean, lake being low, no grant, don't matter. They're, they are as healthy as I've ever seen them from fish to fish. In, yeah, in my, in my entire life of fishing, you know, my, my whole time fishing Lake Fork, I've never seen from one fish to the next consistently them be this thick. Yeah, I caught a good male last weekend with him. Uh, it's probably been right at 16 inches. I didn't measure it, yeah. but um, it will went three and a half pounds easy. Ooh, I mean, long. Big, fat male. Yeah, there's, yeah, there's wow. some big girls. I've seen a couple of them have stretch marks on their belly. Literally. Hmm. Literally, those pros are going to be here next two week weeks. Also, yeah, next so week. Yeah, is it not next week, but the week after? Yeah, they and start like on a Monday or Tuesday. They're all going to yeah, be throwing jerk baits. I, I'd love. I, I can't be on the water that week, but I'd love to go watch some of them and see what they're doing. I'm going to guarantee you, if that water stays cool like that in a lot of places, them jerk baits are going to be worn out. <laughs> yeah, that deal's probably going to depend on uh, weather trends. You know, yeah. I mean, if they get a warming trend, it could completely yeah, change the dynamic of that. Mid 60s, that whole four days. Yeah. One one slight chance of rain. Yeah. I don't know. We'll have to see. I mean, you never see around here this time of year. Yeah. I mean, I hear you. That's the forecast, but I don't trust it more than about two or three days out at most right now, just because it's yeah. it's crazy. Sometimes they have a hard time it day to day. Next right. Day. Yeah. It can flip in a hurry. Yeah. yeah. And, and so many things can change. You can literally have three days, four days of weather. And fish go from pre-spawn to spawning in a, in, a, in an entire area of the lake right now. Fish can just start jumping up on beds and start spawning. I mean, it can happen. I've caught plenty of fish off beds this time of year on Lake Fort uh, under the right conditions. So you never know right now. It's, it's, you got to be on your toes. Yeah, I've heard you say after Valentine's Day, start looking. Val uh, Valentine's Day when they start making love, I'm telling you. <laughs> so I, I, you know, I know I bring out my granddaddy a lot, but the man was a, was a fishing genius. I mean, he was really good. But he always, and I told him this other day, but when a dogwood tree is blooming. That's it. Yep. My dad told me the same thing, and it's very true. So the actual, and I've got it dialed in, dude. Here's the deal. You wanna, I've got that deal dialed in. That, that is my kind of science. Right. That's Billy Ray Redneck science right there is what that is. <laughs> so when the dogwood trees get that bloom on and white flowers come out, that is for sure, 100%, this is guaranteed. That's the first significant wave of fish on the lake. Now, it's not going to be all across the whole lake. You're not going to go down there to the mouth of Little Canyon and find them on the bed on the we main lake bank. Wood trees around there. Oh, yeah. The Plenty of them. Bunch of them. What kind That's of, me when that of, happens. What kind of fishing? That's the first <laughs> significant, the first significant spawning bass. I don't know where a the first significant here. wave of spawning bass happens every year exactly when the dogwood spawn. So if you're driving the lake and you see white flowers everywhere, the north, like the mid to northern half of the lake, there's fish on beds. I promise you there is. I mean, it's happened every single year. 
And then you'll get some before that. You know, the ones that we look at for Valentine's Day, that's usually like the few scragglers here and there, you know. Like you can go find one pocket that's got four or five in it, or but not a big part of the lake until the dogwoods bloom. When the dogwoods bloom, they spawn it. It started. That's the beginning. Yeah, no, my dad told me that when I was a kid, too. Yeah. That's how I didn't know to believe my granddaddy or not, but, you know, like kill a snake, put it belly up on the fence, it'll rain till it rots off. I swear you watch the weather. I'm just saying because it happened. All right, now you're just, <laughs> you just making stuff up. Now we're just making stuff up. Y'all got any more questions? No? I, I do have one question. What's that? About your 25 pound you flow fluorocarbon. What brand? Because I've Twi got two or three. Yeah. And if I get over about 17 in cold weather, yeah. it's still yeah, okay. All right. Well All right. So I don't know. 20, pa 20 pound, not 25, 20 okay. pound. And so I actually do use Seaguar Red Label, which is a very stiff brand of fluorocarbon. It's got a lot of memory, but we stretch it every day. All of them. We're, right. we're fishing every day. I'll tell you one that's the best one for, that's a good strong line that's not gonna break on you, okay. that is that has the less memory, is is Berkeley 100% fluorocarbon. Then a gold label, just like the same people that make big game, and it, but it's expensive now. Now that stuff's high. That Berkeley 100% fluorocarbon is real expensive, but that is the softest, less memory fluorocarbon that I've ever used. Okay. Yeah, all fluorocarbon, if you nick it though, if it nicks, and I mean, you got rods and rod boxes or kicking them around on the deck, you get a nick on one of them things, that's a disaster with fluorocarbon. Don't tell me, you, you're trying to tell me to use monofilament line. I know that's not what you're saying, are you? No, I don't. No, oh, okay. no. what I'm saying is... Six pound test, that's why it's Well, but it's still floor carbon. <laughs> so what are you, you saying if it nicks no, it but in the I mean, it, it, I've had it happen a lot. Throwing 16 and 17 pound where, I mean, you set up and a line breaks. I mean, you get a yeah. nick because they'll bang up the rods, bang into each other on the deck. Or <laughs> because I've got 35 rods in one compartment is what I have. And I mean, and I've, in the times when I've noticed I've had problems with all them damn rods. How many different drop shot rods does a man need? Uh, <laughs> I've only got four of those, I got and two of those are four, clients. I've got four of those. But, uh, but I mean, yeah, it's, it's, rod pour. it's, you run a little bit more risk with fluorocarbon. He and I did some videos this fall where he was throwing uh, the heavy 17. line versus light line yeah. and learned a big lesson on that because uh, even the fluorocarbon versus mono, when the water's really off color, I don't. there's no difference. There's no advantage. You're to, not gonna get more bites. To the fluorocarbon, clean. not at all. It's when the water is clearer on a sunny day is when it does make a difference. Yeah, it's, yeah but for what we deal with in East Texas, like your standard East Texas watercolor in most of our lakes, it, the line size, as far as the visibility causing a difference in bites or anything like that, it's not really gonna happen. The only thing you gotta watch out for is if, the, if you get so much of a drastic out of balance line size that it affects the action of the bait. If it can affect the action of the bait, then that's probably gonna give you some issues. Or if you get in a clearer water, like David's saying, that's obviously gonna be a different deal. But in our standard East Texas watercolor, I don't think it makes any yeah, difference at all. Because we did, we shot two videos and on two lakes and the water on each lake wasn't clear, all right? And one so was I dirty, was dirty. Using eight pound yeah. line. He was using seventeen, right? And we had the, we had I counted the bites. We had we had the exact same amount of bites. The but I landed more because he broke he off. He landed more <laughs> exactly because I broke off eight pound line. That's I broke right. off three times and I couldn't boat flip him where he was boat flipping six pounders. Yes. I wasn't so, gonna help him land them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, young, young. It's like Bassmaster right. dog, no net. Young, young. I wanted young. to do that for a reason, to just to really to yes. just prove it. But yeah. I've had situations in it's at Athens, for example, when the eye of the water it can seven foot there. clear. You it can, can matter there. Far. It can matter there. And I've had it happen at Welch it too. It can matter there. Yeah. Gin clear. Yeah. Hawkins, yeah. Nobody Hawkins. fishes Hawkins. And then it makes Hawkins a big is, uh, difference. Nobody yeah. fish Hawkins. You might fish Hawkins. I've been Saturday night derby, man. No once ever. All right, yes, sir. I don't, I don't know if everybody knows it, but they put out an update on the... the right, they're going to keep it down I for a while it. longer. Yep. They're keeping it down. No, they, there's, they there's, said indefinitely. There's no there's no estimated date on when until until they're done working on it. They said they're, they got some more work to do. Yeah, there's no, there's no estimate on when they're going to let it fill back up. So looks like we're going to go through, and honestly, if we get through spring, we're going to go through this whole year with this lake six foot lower, lower. Don't get rain, it don't come up. Well, they're they're not going to let They'll it come let it up out. when we get when we do get rain in the spring. They're not going to let it come up, 
So if they keep it, if they maintain it at six foot low through the springtime and we get to summer, you know, we could potentially be looking at a seven or eight or nine foot low lake by next fall. I just wish they would extend these floating docks a little bit. <laughs> they're no longer floating docks, they're resting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> on the ground, Jack. There's not a pontoon boat sitting on the dirt right now. It's pretty amazing. What about the folks that got their boats still in their hangar? on the lake all the time. Can you tell me what ramps that y'all use? I, I mean, the 515 know. I've been using 515 West or 154. That's the two yeah. that I use. The two public ramps. And those are for sure good for a Mustang. long time. I've been launching a Mustang I, I every day. The East ramp, the 515 East ramp. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah, it's fine. There's still several that are good. I've even heard the 2946 ramp is still okay right now. Somebody told me, but I don't know. I don't know about that one, but I've heard it was fine. Oh, yeah. They... I went by the other day. They were actually had a track out there, and they were digging it out. Okay, so it's good. But yeah, either 515 ramps and a 154. All three of those are good for a long way down. You can still use Hideaway Harbor. So when the lake and Minnebago too. 2011 when it went down. <clears throat> They just, those, those ramps were still good. Yeah, they, way good. They those they've been the launching ramps, off those ramps. Resort, See the, the lake. Extend it out. Yeah, but it's not. Yeah, it's, it's not good now. Oh, okay. It's they extended it out after the lake drop for when the lake comes back up. You can't use it right now. Yeah, you can. Lake Fork Resort. Yep. Oh, you. All they right. Extended it six foot. Okay. Did y'all say that twenty nine forty six? You can launch there now. Right now they're saying yeah, I've vowels? heard you can. I've heard you can. No. If, no. Or not or not uh, vowels. Or uh, range. Although vowels vowels range might wood. be okay. Rainswood you can launch. Like I said, I the, think prop washing. Is yeah, but the problem with rainswood is you go back off by three foot, it comes up. Yeah, you behind up, the ramp. Pull yeah. up next to that dock right there. There's a big pile of rocks there, and you bang your prop up on them things. So the the two 515s and the one what I'm trying to say, the two 515s and the 154 bridge, they were launching off of those ramps as the lake was filling when it first opened. So those ramps are theoretically good down to 15, 20 foot low, like crazy stuff. I heard they're like 200 foot long. They're they're way out there. Like I've seen pictures of guys standing on that ramp launching their boat, and like. The bridge is like 30 foot above the water, so like 20 foot above the water, so it's crazy. Mm -hmm. The 154 bridge, yeah, and the 515 bridge, yeah. So those three ramps, I mean, that's that's three places you can launch and pretty much get anywhere on lake you want to. Um, they'll be good, basically. I mean, unless the lake dries completely up, they'll be good no matter what. Cool. Yeah. All right. It's like we're done. We talked moving long tonight. Long one tonight. Dave, David, you wouldn't shut up, I swear. Uh, <laughs> Cody, God dang, you talk too much. Um, now, thank you guys. Obviously, thanks to Lake Fork Marina, um, and thank you to everybody who watches on YouTube. Uh, they just got an order in. I begged them to do it, and they, Lake Fork Marina, like they always do, answered the call. There is plenty of black and blue jigs down there and black, blue, and purple jigs down there in half and three-quarter ounce, six-inch hybrid jigs right downstairs. So if y'all need some of those, I suggest you get them now because they have been hard to find around here lately so uh go get your hands on some of those and spend your money here at lake fork marina we'll appreciate it thank you guys we'll be back in two thank weeks yes sir